We're here at the British Library in the exhibition space for Unfinished Business and the reason we're here is to talk about your work, um, Anne-Marie, uh, as the founder of STEMET and your work to try and encourage girls into um, careers in STEM, which we think is unfinished business. And I'm here because I'm a PhD student with the British Library, but I've also done some work for the exhibition on women who went into careers as scientists in the civil service. Perhaps you could just tell me a little bit about your group, STEMET. So yeah, so I run STEMET. Uh, we are a social enterprise based here in the UK, based in London, um, but we work across the country with girls and non-binary young folk and young women aged from five all the way up to 25. And our mission, our aim, kind of what we do is to inspire, support and motivate them into what we call STEM careers, STEM being science, technology, engineering, math, or technical careers as we call them sometimes. Because I know you've got a background as a computer scientist, so perhaps was there a moment when you thought, actually, I want to leave the science and move into this sort of campaigning role? What really brought that home to you? So there was one particular moment. I ended up at a conference in the States for technical women and the year I was there, the end of 2012 was, was this, this, this moment. Um, I arrived and it was three and a half thousand technical women in this one conference. And I'd never been in that kind of environment. And I'd been you know, into tech since I was four years old. I've been always on the computer, always taking things apart, always solving maths problems. And I never noticed, never realized that I was always, as a, as a woman, as a girl, I was always in a minority in those technical spaces. So whether it was at university, 70 of us in the lecturers, and it was me, Karina and Clarice that were there, you know, for the boys, or whether it was, you know, those maths exams, a lot of the time there were very few of us anyway, and I was the only girl, um, and only black girl in, in quite a lot of these scenarios. And being at the conference, it was so, it was different, but it was, uh, re it was like a life reaffirming moment, right? Sometimes you don't know what you're missing until you've kind of, you've got it. We've had a look at the picture round the corner of the um, book written by one of the first women to get a medical degree. For me, it's just interesting to look at how a group like that had to really fight when we take university education as a complete um, given for anyone who wants to do it now, um, that they had to fight so hard in that they then went overseas to actually gain their degree. But it's interesting because even one of my interviewees that I uh, met for my research who went to Manchester University in the 1960s or 70s. She also had that experience where she was initially not going to gain the same degree. So I think what I've really tried to look at through the research is women who just see science as a career, a career that's interesting. They're not geniuses, they're women who want to work and science is what they feel is where they belong. Mm. But I, I also know just from my own um, experience as an on-scientist that lay people can see it as a separate world, you know, something that's a world that's very esoteric, they're not going to understand what's going on and it's not for them. So it's sort of finding, finding a way, isn't it, to show children or girls and non-binary kids what they can do in science and it's that it's not off-putting in that sense. Is that something you've experienced? So, so this is definitely something that we see and I think you know it's, it's about the girls the non-binary young people and, and them in their formative years seeing that science is something that they can dip into but I think it's definitely something we see wholesale for women of any age, people of any age, that science does feel like its own, it is its own culture with its own rituals and its own language and its own norms. And quite a lot of those are, have ended up being kind of built on gatekeeping, right? And this kind of elitist element of, well, I can do the science and you can't, or I was born to do the science and you weren't. And I think this is something we see with the Edinburgh Seven, 
Um, but also, you know, we were having a look at the fireworks and the kind of confetti from the Girton protest, but it is this kind of sometimes quite physical, other times it's more subtle, this is not a space for you, which I think is interesting. You know, you've interviewed someone that, who had that experience in 1960s, that's still within living memory, right? Of the, we're gonna draw this line and, and we're inside the line and you're outside the line. And that's not really what science is about. So I think with us and the young people, we are always about saying, do you know what? There are some people who, you know, have always known science is for them and that's the core of what they want to do and they love science for science's sake. But actually, this is about more than that, right? This is, a, this is the application of knowledge, which is what science is. But you want to be able to apply that in different places and you don't have to just go through that one route. I don't think one of them spoke about having a burning passion for science, you know, from the age of eight. They were all, they all sort of made their way there by various means. The, might have been a teacher that influenced them or encouraged them or they had a, a parent who was quite technical and encouraged them to sort of just shadow them when they were doing DIY, something like that. Yeah. But it's not someone who woke up one day and said, I really like physics. <laughs> <laughs> but for her, it was very much, you know, they were in the school lab with the physics teacher and just building stuff and sort of trying things out. It's also the creativity, the altruism and the diversity across what they have in STEM, which I think, you know, if we, if more folks were able to get creative with the science and not just see it as, I must memorise this or, you know, I must recall that, but it's, you know, if I, if I know that and if I know that, what can I create? What can come together? What can I own? I am heartened or I do feel I'm happy in the knowledge that now things have progressed to a point where there are multiple entry points into STEM careers. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's apprenticeships, whether it's the new T-levels, whether it's you know, being able to build your own portfolio and use the, the breadth of the internet to learn and, and, and discover things and try things outside of the very straight and narrow kind of linear system that we had before, I think is definitely opening it up. And, and it is unfinished business, opening up those new doors to folks, because again, it's not purely about the young people and, and their pathways, but it's about, you know, keep going to lawyers, sports people becoming technologists and technologists becoming sports people and having that cross-pollination of ideas, um, which will definitely take us to the new level, new frontier, right, across science. But I think there is, there is that element of, um, people want to have options, people need to have options. It's, it's kind of a, a common theme, I think, across quite a few things across the exhibition, that idea of choice. I think that's the quote that the book is opened up to for Elizabeth, for the Edinburgh Seven, but it is about, you know, you've got to allow people to make an informed choice and see the breadth of the choices and the options that they have.